Now for today's program. Martin Indyk is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, and Special Assistant to President Clinton. Previously, Ambassador Indyk was Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution, where he had also served as Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program and the founding director of its Center for Middle East Policy. He served as President Obama's Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations from July 2013 to June 2014. He is the author of Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger, and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Joining Ambassador Indyk is journalist Dan Raviv, who was a CBS News correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. A Moment Magazine contributor, Dan is the author of several books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Every Spy a Prince and Friends Indeed Inside the U.S.-Israel Alliance, in addition to Comic Wars, an account of how Marvel Comics went bankrupt but was turned into a movie powerhouse by two Israeli Americans. Please welcome Ambassador Martin Indyk and Dan Raviv. Uh, while Dan is getting his uh, connection back, um, Ambassador Indig, why don't you uh, start with telling us how you came to write this book? Thanks, Susan, and thank you to Moment Magazine for the opportunity to talk about my book, uh, which has just been published. I, um, I think that the world doesn't really need another uh, book on Henry Kissinger, you could say. My bookshelves are groaning with uh, those that he has written and, and those that have others written, others have written about him. But um, in that uh, voluminous uh, number of books, uh, there isn't one that has focused on his Middle East diplomacy. And that's somewhat surprising, given that as Secretary of State for four years, he focused on little else but uh, trying to make peace in the Middle East following the outbreak of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And uh, he was very successful at that effort, labeled shuttle diplomacy. It was the best example of relentless diplomacy that President Biden today talks about. Uh, and over that four year period, he negotiated two agreements between Israel and Egypt and one between Israel and Syria and laid the foundations for the American led peace process as we know it. I myself had been involved subsequently with President Clinton and, and then with President Obama in trying to negotiate um, Arab-Israeli and Israeli-Palestinian peace. And, and those efforts, uh, for the most part, uh, had failed, uh, much like uh, the four presidents, starting with President Clinton, going all the way to President Trump, had tried and failed to make peace in the Middle East. And it was at the end of that last effort under President Obama, when I was special envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, that I decided that I needed to go back and try to understand what, what was going wrong. And there would be no better place to start than where it all began with the uh, Kissinger's efforts to launch the Arab-Israeli peace process. And uh, by studying him in depth, because all of the documents are available both in the American and Israeli archives, and by interviewing him, and by illuminating the story with my own experiences, I could take uh, the reader into the rooms where the diplomacy happens behind the closed doors, and in the process, uh, explain how to and how not to make peace in the Middle East. So that, that's the reason why I wrote this book. Hey, Martin, are you able to hear and see me? It's Dan. Yeah, you're fine. And see you. Either. I know, I had, a bit, I know I, I had a bit of a technical problem. Sorry about that. Now, Martin, sometimes people need a reminder, even a Moment magazine audience, um, who think of Henry Kissinger when it comes to Israel, Israel and its neighbors, and they think about the Yom Kippur War. Now, your book, of course, covers, well, even from the very day that he became the national security advisor to President Nixon, uh, when Nixon was inaugurated at the beginning of 1969, uh, and later Kissinger became secretary. Martin, do you want to continue with that line of questioning? <laughs> well, I'm not sure where he was going, but I, I can guess. <laughs> uh, 
Kissinger was was an unusual appointment for Richard Nixon, who who was essentially kind of anti-Semitic in his in his instincts. Kissinger called it a social anti-Semitism, but nevertheless he was he he viewed the Jews as controlling uh, the press and and being the source of of much of his problems. And yet he appointed Kissinger as his national security advisor. The one thing that he told Kissinger when he appointed him was that he was going to work with Kissinger on China and and the Soviet Union and and Vietnam and and all the big issues. But uh, the Middle East was going to be the preserve of the Secretary of State, uh, then William Rogers, um, because and Nixon told Kissinger, and then he wrote it in his biography, that he didn't trust Kissinger when it came to Israel, that he considered him suspect, um, uh, subject to dual loyalty. And so therefore, he excluded Kissinger from dealing with the Middle East, or at least tried to. It took Kissinger about three years to uh, of, overcome uh, Nixon's objections, undermine the Secretary of State, Bill Rogers and and eventually get control of Middle East policy too, but but that was the environment in which he operated in, essentially anti-Semitic president and anti-Semitic White House, even though there were other Jews like uh, Bill Sapphire uh, who worked there, and and so Kissinger had to operate when it came to the Middle East in essentially a hostile environment with a essentially hostile State Department as well. And so as a result of all of that, he basically obfuscated his essentially uh, pro-Israel approach. Um, And pro-Israel because he thought that served the best interests of the United States, but also because as a Jew, even though he was not religious, he did identify uh, with Israel's struggle for survival. And uh, in all sorts of ways, that I uh, shine a light on in the book, but uh, he never uh, publicized. Uh, he went to quite extraordinary lengths to help Israel. In fact, you write in the book that uh, on many occasions in negotiating with Israeli leaders, he told them, this is good for you, I care about you. Uh, why was the Israeli side so, well, so skeptical of what he was trying to do? Well, um, on, on, in, on one side, they did view him, this is Golda Meir in particular, who was the prime minister, when Kissinger began his, his Middle East diplomacy. Uh, she regarded him as a kind of member of the family, uh, a, a, a young nephew, as it were. Uh, and she would um, play the Jewish guilt card very effectively uh, with him. On the other hand, she didn't trust him uh, at all. And, and that was partly because uh, Israel was a, s- a small and isolated uh, state in those days. And, and uh, the United States was a superpower. And Kissinger, you know, although he was a big celebrity and, and very famous for all the achievements of detente and ending the war in Vietnam and uh, the opening of China, nevertheless, they, they, uh, they saw him as, as somebody who was who was coming to finagle them, to manipulate them. And indeed, Kissinger was, I call the book, the master of the game, because Kissinger was the master of that game of diplomacy, which is basically uh, getting uh, leaders to go to places they'd rather not go and making them want to go there. And Kissinger was was very good at that. And the Israelis didn't like it, uh, even though they came to appreciate him. Now, for those who, who don't remember the big issue, it was mostly between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria. This was not Israel and the Palestinians back then. So it was so sensitive. Would you get Israel to even withdraw its forces? Uh, what, what, what's our focus? Uh, the Yom Kippur War, October 1973. It, of course, took everyone by surprise. Israel was taken by surprise. Kissinger didn't plan it. Uh, but, it's, but it was an opportunity, right? He started traveling to uh, Israel, to Egypt, uh, to Moscow to have the Soviets involved. I guess there was no other way. Uh, how would you describe what suddenly happened in October of 73 in terms of his Middle East diplomacy? 
So before 1973, say so it took him a while to get control of the policy. Um, but when he did, he he brought his rail politic approach to the issue and sought to establish a balance of power in the favor of those countries that would stabilize the region. So for example, the Shah of Iran um, got a lot of support from Kissinger and Nixon to stabilize the Gulf. He became the kind of America's policeman in the Gulf. In the Arab-Israeli arena, where uh, the Arab states led by Egypt and Syria were in conflict with Israel, backed by the Soviet Union and armed by the Soviet Union, he supported Israel and provided uh, sophisticated uh, military equipment to Israel, including F-4 Phantom aircraft, uh, that were the kind of F-35s of the day, uh, in order to maintain a balance in favor of Israel and in favor of the status quo. <clears throat> Sadat and Assad of, of Syria upended the status quo by launching the surprise attack on Yom Kippur of 1973. And Kissinger moved with great alacrity to try to build a more stable order, recognizing that the Arabs had to have a stake in the order, uh, otherwise they would go back to war again uh, to regain territory that Israel had occupied as a result of the 1967 war. And so therefore, Kissinger designed his peace process to uh, give the Arabs a sense of fairness, uh, that is to say, some territory. He had to convince the Israelis to give up some territory. But in order to protect Israel, he only sought a, a what he called a step-by-step -step process designed to give up tranches of territory over a prolonged period of time, rather than the idea that Eisenhower had made popular back in the previous war, 1956, the Suez Crisis, when he had forced Israel to withdraw entirely from the Sinai. And that had in effect laid the, laid the foundations for the 1973 war. So Kissinger's approach was very different. It was, it was to have a peace process that would stabilize the order by giving the Arabs a stake in that order but only a peace process that he felt Israel could digest by insisting that Israel make territorial withdrawals in small steps. Let's, uh, let, that, let's note, if we can, Martin, that your book often speaks of the smaller steps, of the gradualism. You write that you yourself, when you were President Obama's uh, special envoy working under Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, uh, trying to bring peace, uh, an effort that uh, that didn't succeed. You admitted, of course, that made well that you'd gone that you'd, you you would try to do too much all at once, settle the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, and you wish you'd acted more like Dr. Kissinger. And we'll get back to the seventies, but but jump ahead for a second. What could you and your team have done differently in twenty? When would that be? 2013, 2014? Well, that's right, Dan. Well, actually, I'd go back a little bit to, to uh, the Clinton uh, era. Um, but it, it wasn't just Clinton or Obama and Kerry, it was also uh, Donald Trump and uh, George W. Bush when he got around to trying as well. All, all the, all the uh, presidents that came after Kissinger um, knew not of his gradual approach. It was partly because of the circumstances which we can get into, but essentially Carter and, and all the others sought to end the conflict. Not for them was this idea of a gradual incremental approach. And I was very much uh, of that mind too, even though I had studied Kissinger. Um, when I uh, first sat with President Clinton as his Middle East advisor at the beginning of his administration, I told him that the stars were aligned with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the first Iraq war and all the Arabs sitting in negotiations directly with Israel, that the stars were aligned. And if he put his mind to it, he could 
end the Arab-Israeli conflict in his first term. Uh, he could get four peace agreements. And, and he looked at me and he nodded his head. He said, I want to do that. And off we went. Now, you and know, that was early 1993. 93. Of course, the, uh, by the end of that year, amazing things had happened. Yes. Exactly. We started with the Oslo Accords uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and then the Israel Jordan Peace Treaty in, in 1994. And it looked like um, we were on our way to ending the Arab Israeli conflict. And I never thought for a moment this is too dangerous, this is too ambitious. But that's what Kissinger would have said at the time, indeed said it to me afterwards. And so that at the end of the Clinton administration, when Ehud Barak became prime minister, after a period of Netanyahu being prime minister and dragging his feet, uh, Barak came to Washington and he said more or less the same thing. Let's end the conflict. You and me, Bill, we'll do it in my first year, in your last year. And the two of them went off and they schlepped Arafat to Camp David. He did not want to go. And they were determined to have an end of claims, end of conflict agreement. And, and it blew up in our faces. And uh, with the Intifada, you recall, that, that occurred after Camp David, thousands killed or maimed on, on both sides and all trust between Israelis and Palestinians was destroyed. And essentially since then, it's been impossible to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, no matter how much the United States has tried. And so there's a lot of wisdom, I think, looking back now at, at um, recognizing that ending the conflict is a bridge too far, is something that will take a long time. And we have to approach it with much more caution and skepticism and try to rebuild the trust step by step. And, and, and we'll get there eventually, but we have to view it as a long-term process. We will return to the current day, but like any good documentary film, we can go back then to the 1970s. One thing that a lot of American, well, American Jews, people concerned about Israel remember is the airlift, right? While the war was still raging in October of 73, President Nixon did send um, uh, arms, uh, ammunition. Uh, what is, Israel needed replenishment urgently. And a lot of people say, and some have written, that Kissinger delayed that trying to twist Israel's arm. Uh, you spent some time in your book, Master of the Game, on that. Yes, and, and as I went through the uh, documentary record, Henry Kissinger, as a man of history and a student of history himself, preserved every uh, conversation he had, every uh, meeting, every negotiation, every phone call, even with his girlfriends. Uh, in the midst of the 73 war, for instance, there's a transcript of a, of a conversation with Liza Bedelli. Um, <laughs> and, and, and therefore, the, the, the documents, for better or for worse for, for Kissinger, are, are there for all the, to study now. And so I was quite meticulous in going back over it. And the story is, of course, with everything that involves Henry Kissinger, more complicated. Uh, he... He began the war with uh, a desire to ensure that, um, the, that Israel would win. He could not countenance the idea that a Soviet-backed Arab army, the Egyptian army or the Syrian army, could defeat an American-backed Israeli army. So from his point of view, that uh, in terms of superpower relations uh, was unacceptable. So he intended to make sure that Israel would win. At first, the assumption was that Israel would clean it up in three days. I was a student in Israel when the war broke out in Jerusalem, and I know that was the prevailing view in Israel, my view as well, that it would be over in a matter of days because Israel had military superiority. That was the assumption. Um, and it was a huge shock to Kissinger, who wasn't informed about what had happened for three days. Um, and for, the, for Israeli, the Israeli public, when we all discovered around the same time 
that the that the Egyptian army had crossed the Suez Canal and the Syrian army had actually been on its way down the Golan Heights. And, and the consequence of that was that Kissinger then refocused on how to supply Israel. At that point, he was worried about um, an overt supply of Israel triggering uh, an oil, Arab oil embargo. A not unreasonable concern, since that's exactly what happened when they did the overt supply, and that Arab oil embargo plunged the world into a global recession. So, as the Secretary of State of the United States, there wasn't an unreasonable concern. But as he sought different ways to get Israel the material that it needed, once it became clear that that the war wasn't going the way Israel wanted, um, he learned that. Uh, the Israelis, or at least this is what the Israelis told him, were not able to prosecute the war because they didn't have the means to do so. And at that point, he pivoted because his diplomacy depended on Israel's successful use of force. He had no interest in holding up arms to Israel because he needed Israel to be pressing offensively against the Egyptians and the Syrians in order to get them to agree to the ceasefire, which was the key to his diplomacy. So he then, he was talking to Nixon this whole time. He then went to Nixon and, and explained that they should try, they should uh, make a, a ship, large shipment using C5As. Um, and he came in and requested with, with Schlesinger, the, the defense secretary, some some three C5As to get the stuff to Israel straight away and other, other ways. And then Nixon looked at him and said, Henry, if we send, we're gonna get blamed for three as much as we'll get blamed for 30. So you send everything that flies and do it now. And that was, that was Nixon's intervention for which Nixon deserves credit. Um, he took it credit too, but he deserves credit. For the no wonder Golda government. Meir. Yeah, or we remember the Prime Minister Golda Meir. You know, absolutely thanked Nixon, who wanted it mostly, right. and Kissinger both. By the way, there's an element that you touch upon. Uh, first, I should say that you you have so much in the book that is about yourself, especially when you are working you know, for the U.S. government. But at that juncture, about '73, you mentioned that you were an Australian student in Israel, and you yeah. thought you were even hearing the. Uh, American resupply planes. But by the way, you report something in the book that you wouldn't have said in 73, uh, that it was, uh, it was assumed or practically known by the CIA and other agencies that Israel had a nuclear arsenal of some size. And so you have found something, other people didn't make the connection. You said that when Golda Meir first visited the new president Nixon in 69, in September, they had a chat, no declassified records. Uh, mm -hmm. And at least part of it was about Israel's nuclear arsenal. And they seem to have reached an agreement, what, that Israel would always keep it secret and unacknowledged and ambiguous. And in exchange, you write, the US, Nixon at least, became committed to making sure Israel was the strongest party. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, a, a, a very good summary of, of what happened, except that it was Kissinger that brokered the deal. And, and it was Kissinger who uh, arranged for the arms control bureaucracy in, in the United States, which was very much focused on, on trying to prevent Israel from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, he, he reached this understanding with Golda, which was... Uh, memorialized in her conversation with President Nixon, as you say, and became the basis for every prime minister in his or her first meeting with the president ever since, a reaffirmation of this understanding that um, Israel would not declare that it was a nuclear power. It would uh, keep its bomb in the basement, as it were, and in return, the United States would provide Israel with the conventional military means to maintain a balance of power in its favor. That was the basic bargain that Kissinger did, and it's, it's lasted ever since. Uh, it's been enhanced to this notion of maintaining Israel's qualitative edge.
So it's become more granular in the commitment. But the basic commitment to um, keep the bomb in the basement, quote unquote, um, has lasted ever since. Now, this is a good moment to remind our audience, you're not only uh, the author of a Council on Foreign Relations nonfiction book, The Master of the Game, about Henry Kissinger's Middle East diplomacy, but also a former United States ambassador to Israel. So I think you know about as much as America knows <laughs> about whatever Israel has in terms of its capabilities and intentions. But let's go back again to the seventh comment on that. Uh, well, it's fine. Good for you. Uh, in the 70s, Kissinger, he was a superstar. Anything he did in the field, whether it was in Moscow or a secret trip to China, which then led to President Nixon going to China and recognizing the People's Republic. Uh, but in the Middle East, well, you have a chapter in your book called Henry of Arabia. Right? It, it, the press traveled. This was complicated stuff. And yet the media adored him and everything he did. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't just complicated stuff. It was heady stuff. Um, Kissinger in those days was a real celebrity. Uh, he was flying around the world, uh, pulling off these amazing feats of diplomacy. Uh, the Chinese referred to him as the magician. And, and uh, you know, as I said before, ending the war in Vietnam, although that was highly controversial the way he did it, uh, opening to China, detente with the Soviet Union, arms control, nuclear arms control agreements. All of these things were, were um, huge achievements. And so when Kissinger embarked on his Middle East diplomacy, he took on his plane um, a, a group of reporters this was the first time that, that this kind of thing happened, I believe. You would probably know better than me. Yeah. But there they were, the, you know, the people that now are icons of, of the American press, uh, Bernard Cowell, Marvin Cowell, uh, Ted Koppel, right. um, all these, these subsequently were giants in those days. They, in fact, built their reputation by traveling with Kissinger and reporting on his diplomatic daring do. And he uh, manipulated them in the way that he was master of the game uh, of, of manipulating the press too, and, and um, fed them. You know, every time he'd, he'd get back on the plane after, after a high level meeting, in Saudi Arabia or Egypt or Israel, he would brief them as um, a senior official traveling with the secretary of state. And, and they would have these great stories, uh, which they then parlayed to the American public. Why did Nixon put up with this? It's an interesting uh, story, because Nixon was basically, at that point, overwhelmed by his Watergate woes and deeply jealous of Kissinger's celebrity status. But on the other hand, Kissinger out there on the Middle East diplomatic high roads was getting positive press for the Nixon administration and in some ways diverting the press from the focus on Watergate, the kind of relentless focus on Watergate, so that it became convenient for Nixon to have Kissinger uh, engaged in this, this media uh, hype that came with his, his Middle East diplomacy. And uh, having gone through government records of the United States and of Israel um, and Kissinger's own papers at age 98, he cooperated with you in the book and you certainly thank him and acknowledge that in the book. One conclusion you reached is that he believed that if Israel were to give up captured You're land, again, right? Again. Oh, second. Hopefully you have me again. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Okay, if Israel were to give up captured lands, we should think now of the West Bank, then Israel would have to be stronger and get more military aid, or these days um, resupply for the Iron Dome, you know, to feel safer to make withdrawals. Um, and, and all of it seems like it could have been a positive policy loop. I guess you would write as, as long as it was gradual, and you didn't ask the Israelis to give up all the land. Well, here's the, the important point about Kissinger's diplomacy. Kissinger himself was deeply skeptical of the idea that you could have peace between warring powers. 
not just in the Arab-Israeli context, but in this case, particularly in the Arab-Israeli context. He, he uh, wrote in his first book, which was his PhD dissertation, about the world order that was created by Metternich and Castlereagh, the foreign ministers of Austria and, and Great Britain, after the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, a European order that they established that lasted more or less for 100 years before it broke down in the First World War. And Kissinger writes there about the problems of peace. For him, peace was problematic. He, he, he believed that he talked about it as the paradox of peace, that the pursuit of peace with too much energy and too much ambition, as he believed American presidents were, were wont to do, would lead, in his view, to the opposite. And his study of history proved that, that, well, that yeah. the too eager pursuit of peace would actually destabilize the order and lead to war. So what he was- No, in, you've, made clear, you've made clear in the book, indeed his goal was international order of that old fashioned type. But if we, if we drill down to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, you also write that the right wing in Israel, notably West Bank settlers, took advantage of all that time, built more settlements, politically it became impossible to even think you could remove them all. And that's become a major impediment, hasn't it? Or at least you write that young Palestinians yeah. now have given up hope in part because yeah. settlers seem to be ruling the roost. Yes, that is the cruel irony of Kissinger's diplomacy. He, he, because he was skeptical of peace, he did not try to convince the Israelis to give up territory for peace, which is the formula that, that we've come to accept, you know, that, that there should be a trade of territory for peace. He never tried that. What he argued was Israel should ex exchange territory in pieces for time, time for it to reduce its isolation, time for it to strengthen itself, and most important of all, time for the Arabs to come to terms with Israel. And so his, his whole approach as I said before, was incremental and gradual so that Israel could, uh, when the Arabs eventually came around to accepting it, would be strong enough to make the ultimate territorial concessions. But along the way, there had to be territorial concessions. The irony of, of it was that he so succeeded in convincing the Israelis, and it wasn't just right-wingers, it started with Labour Party leaders of, of Golda and, and Yitzhak Rabin, uh, he so persuaded them to trade territory for time that it became the foundational basis of their peace process diplomacy. And indeed, they traded territory. Um, they gave up all of the Sinai for, for peace with Egypt, which came a lot faster than Kissinger expected. But when it came to the West Bank, they traded other territory, where they offered to give up the Golan Heights or withdraw from, from Gaza to hold on to the West Bank. And, and when Kissinger left office, there were 1,600 settlers in the West Bank. Today, there's something like 466,000 in 131 settlements. So Kissinger never had, had in mind that, that time would be used to settle the territory that he intended um, that Israel would need to give up eventually over time. Um, and so as a result, it's now reached a point when it comes to the West Bank, where giving up the territory that Kissinger envisaged seems almost politically impossible. Um, and so, so the, the consequence, unintended indeed, of Kissinger's diplomacy when it comes to the West Bank was that it created the opportunity for settlers, as you say, to take advantage of it and, and effectively make it extremely difficult, if not well nigh impossible, um, to uh, establish an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank and in Gaza that, that could uh, form the basis of what we refer to as the two-state solution. 
And in your book, The Master of the Game, you report, as I say, a lack of hope by uh, young people on both sides. Uh, it's not the first priority to reach a two-state solution, at least the way things are now. But you also write one of your valuable uh, conclusions is that the Israeli-Palestinian dispute is not that important to overall United States interests. We have Iran as a hostile player. We have massive Sunni Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia, which are important. And of course, two of them, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, less than 18 months ago, uh, decided to recognize Israel, <laughs> sign something with President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu. And, and would you agree that seems to be going well and represents acceptance that Israel viscerally wanted for decades? Right. So absolutely right. I think that, that the Abraham Accords from a Kissingerian point of view, um, occurred on Kissinger's timetable. You know, it took 40 years for, for the Moroccans, the Emiratis, and, and the Bahrainis and the Sudanese to accept Israel and to uh, normalize their relations with Israel. Uh, that was the kind of timetable that Kissinger expected. Uh, it, it was done um, over the heads of the Palestinians, exactly as Egypt and Syria did when they negotiated their agreements with Kissinger. They showed no concern for the, no more concern for the Palestinians than uh, these other Arab countries. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the question remains, um, can, the Abraham Accords uh, provide a, a, a boost uh, to the effort to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I can go to the point that you quote me on. Kissinger's view of the, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was that it was Israel's problem, not America's problem. That America as an ally of Israel had a responsibility to help Israel solve this problem. But who ruled over, over whose well in the West Bank was not, did not rise to the level of a strategic interest of the United States, strategic interest of Israel for sure, but not of the United States. So therefore his approach was to keep his hands off it, keep it at arm's length. He was focused on getting Egypt out of the war and getting Syria to provide the cover for that. That was critical to the balance of power, that was critical to ending the Arab-Israeli state-to-state conflict. Indeed, he was so successful that no, there was no Arab-Israeli state-to-state conflict after his diplomacy. Mm. Uh, but when it came to the Palestinians, it was a different story. And, now, you, and, Ambassador Indyk, do you think the Abraham Accords will in fact lead maybe under, well, probably under different leaders after Mahmoud Abbas on the Al-Fatah PLOPA side, uh, and who knows who the Israeli prime minister and leaders will be. Do you think, however, that the accords, the normalization with large Arab countries, uh, the money that will flow because of it might in fact attract Palestinians to say, I want a piece of that prosperity, uh, maybe compromising on their, their other goals of having the whole West Bank or even more returning to their homes in what is now Israel. Do you think it will help? Uh, it, it could over time, it will, but you know, because in Jerry way, it will take time. But the key thing I think here is that we're, we're kind of looking under the lamppost at who will be the next country to normalize relations with Israel. And uh, of course, everybody's focused on Saudi Arabia above all the others, because that would be the kind of crown jewels, jewel of the, of the Arab world, the leader of the Muslim and, the, and Arab world, uh, making peace with Israel. Um, but I think we're looking in the wrong place, that uh, for the time being, the advantage of the Abraham Accords is elsewhere. It's setting a standard for Egypt and Jordan and providing them with cover to, in, to warm up their peace, pieces with Israel. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody uh, on this Zoom uh, will be 
familiar with the way in which Egypt and Jordan uh, have maintained cold peace with Israel. Um, peace has essentially been in the freezer for decades in the case of the Egyptians uh, and also with the Jordanians. And, and now they see the benefit that the Emiratis in particular and Bahrain and Morocco are, are gaining from normalizing with Israel. They want a piece of that action. But beyond that, that normalization gives them the cover to engage with Israel. And that's what they're doing when it comes to the Palestinians. For the first time, we see Egypt heavily engaged in Gaza, on the ground, big posters of Sisi, president of Egypt in Gaza these days, big, big bulldozers coming in to build new roads, and hospitals and so on. Um, and and uh, the Egyptians are brokering a long-term ceasefire between Hamas and Israel, as we speak, that they're doing something that they had not previously done, that is helping to stabilize the situation in Kissingerian way, but also helping over time to bring Hamas around to dealing with Israel in ways other than launching rockets. And also, of course, uh, pardon me, we, we're just, uh, we have just a few minutes before we turn, by the way, to questions from our viewers. I just wanted to, to well, I wanted to share the thought that that, that all is, is an effort to reduce Iran's influence. Uh, Iran had been sending arms and money to radicals in the Gaza Strip, for instance. Egypt doesn't want ra uh, extremist Iran to be even more influential there. Of course, Israel doesn't, which brings us to negotiations now underway. Uh, not just the United States, which supposedly has only been indirectly involved since Trump pulled out of the nuclear accord, uh, but the other countries in that accord have been talking with Iran uh, in Vienna. We don't know if the US will re-enter. Uh, what's your take on those talks? Some Israelis think it's life and death uh, and Israel would have to bomb Iran if there's no agreement that really stops Iran's nuclear program. Well, Iran certainly is, is advancing towards the nuclear threshold, point where it, it will be within, within a month or so, um, within weeks of having enough uh, highly enriched uranium um, to make at least one bomb. Now, it could take them a little longer to actually manufacture the bomb, but, but being on that threshold is something that, that the, the nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, was designed to prevent from happening. And, and um, the result, the net result of, of uh, the United States pulling out of that agreement was the Iranians then pulled out and gave them the license. You're absolutely right that, that uh, Iran threatens not only Israel, but, but the Sunni Arab states as well. And so that is really the, the cement for the emerging Israeli uh, Sunni Arab effort to counter um, Iran's hegemonic ambitions uh, in the region. And that, that is something that, from Kissinger's point of view, is exactly what's needed. As the United States focuses attention elsewhere, whether it's Ukraine and, and Eastern Europe or, or the rise of China in Asia, um, the United States needs Israel and our Arab partners, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, Jordanians, to step up. And the fact that they face a common enemy uh, in Iran provides the cement for that, and we can then support them so that, that we're turning from an, an American-dominated Middle East to an American-supported Middle Eastern order that is maintained by Israel and its um, erstwhile strategic partners in, in the Arab world. To the extent you understand the Iran nuclear talks that are underway in Vienna, do you have much hope that uh, a renewed agreement would actually slow or stop the, the Iranian march toward a nuclear uh, capability? Well, um, it looks like the Iranians now are uh, willing to go back into the agreement. We'll see. They're playing brinksmanship uh, in a similar way to, to uh, 
Putin and, and Russia and Ukraine, but it looks like they're, they intend to go back into the agreement. If they do so, all of that enriched uranium, which puts them close to the threshold of a nuclear uh, weapon, will be shipped out and controls will be placed on their centrifuges um, in a way that, that will give uh, the world, including Israel, some assurance that they won't be able to move now to the, the nuclear threshold. It'll buy some time. That's all it will do, because by now they have the knowledge of how to do it. And once the agreement ends, if we don't ex aren't able to extend it, they will be able to, in effect, uh, go back to where they are today. Um, so all it, at, at this stage, all it is is a time buying exercise. But buying time, as Kissinger could tell you, is worth doing in the Middle East, especially for Israel at this moment, because Israel, if you read the press closely, you will see that Israel, for a variety of, of reasons that I find hard to comprehend, is not in a position to take military action against Iran at the moment. It needs to build up its military option again. And so it needs to buy time. And that's why you'll see that the, gov the government of Israel, unlike in the previous time when the deal was done, um, we'll go along with this, not happily, but we'll go along with it because it buys time. If a deal can be reached in Vienna. If, One last thing I'd point out. Yeah, in your book, you, you pointed out, by the way, that when you were the special envoy uh, trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, again, the effort ended in the middle of 2014, you also made your headquarters in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, just like Kissinger. And with due humility, you're saying you found yourself doing many of the same things that the master of the game had done. And you learned a lot more as you... Uh, as you researched, you know, for this book, which I think is so well written, really very clear indeed. Uh, I admire the book and I turn to Suzanne Borden, who probably has questions from some of our viewers. Yes, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ambassador, so much for bringing this to our moment audience. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but let's see what we can get to. Um, why did so many Jews support Nixon, uh, even though he was anti-Semitic? Well, I'm not sure that there were that many Jews that supported Nixon. Um, you know, Jews and Democrats uh, were then, they are today, as part of the reason that he was so against them. They saw the, uh, the Jews as his enemy. But uh, uh, I think that, that uh, those that did uh, support him appreciated his support for Israel, which came out of a strategic calculation rather than any, any love for Jews. Okay, thank you. Uh, because support for Israel in Congress is not as far reaching as it once was, will this affect the United, how the United States is involved in future negotiations? I think that it will affect uh, the way that the United States proceeds, whether it's in negotiations or in its dealings with, with Israel. We saw that we first got a glimpse of that in the Gaza conflict that, that uh, broke out last year in which President Biden, in classic kind of historic uh, position of democratic leaders, stood by Israel, stood by its, its willingness, its need to be able to defend itself, um, and worked with Israel to achieve a ceasefire. That is the kind of standard historic playbook, um, but he came under a lot of criticism from uh, the progressive side of the Democratic Party, who have, as we all are aware now, a voice in Congress in a way that they didn't have before, that affects the calculations of, of other uh, Democratic members of Congress. So it's become more complicated for a Democratic president uh, than it was uh, in the past. And Martin, is it worth pointing out that the Republican Party now is trying to be the pro-Israel party? They might get more Jewish voters, therefore. But the Israeli government has to watch out, don't they, not to just work with Republicans? Well, I mean, I think you can see the, the danger in that approach um, that was pursued by Prime Minister Netanyahu so assiduously. He basically decided that the American Jews were a lost cause and he was better off betting on the evangelicals and the Republicans. 
But the consequence of that is to turn Israel into a partisan issue when it used to be a bipartisan issue. And now the, the government of Israel that came after Netanyahu is trying to rebuild the bipartisan nature of, of the relationship. And it needs to be bipartisan. It can be bipartisan. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a big mistake to bet on one party because sooner or later, usually sooner, the other party will be in power. And then where are we? Mm -hmm. Uh, someone would like to know uh, how much you spoke to Henry Kissinger um, and has he seen the book since it came out and any response from him? Yes, well, I, I was fortunate to uh, have 12 long uh, on the record interviews with him. He was very generous with his time and, and his, his ideas. And, and um, uh, I had a number of other, you know, informal conversations with him as well. And, and so those interviews inform uh, the book uh, and the uh, documentary record. Um, he uh, has read the book. He, uh, I had showed him a couple of chapters earlier on and he, he didn't like them at all. I told my wife that he never wanted to speak to me again. So I was in the doghouse for a while. Uh, but after he read the book, he, he called me and he thanked me. And uh, he thanked me because even though he didn't like the way it made him look manipulative, um, he accepted my argument that that was the nature of the game. That was the whole point of studying him, to learn from his manipulative uh, techniques. Um, and he, I think he, in, in the end, appreciated that um, somebody should spend so much time and so much effort recounting his uh, diplomatic uh, uh, daring do in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it is, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fascinating story mm -hmm. and there's a lot to learn from, from that. So he, he, in the end, even though he didn't like the portrait of him, he appreciated the attention mm -hmm. and he appreciated the title. <laughs> he said, well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> um, can you please comment on the enshrinement in law of U.S. commitment to maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge when arms deals are being made with other countries? Right. So as, uh, as I mentioned when, in, a, in a conversation with Dan, this commitment began with Kissinger and Nixon. Um, commitment to maintain um, the military balance in Israel's favor. Uh, that was then enshrined in the Second Sinai Disengagement Agreement, not Disengagement, Second Sinai Agreement, the Interim Agreement, that, that Kissinger negotiated with Yitzhak Rabin, and which involved a knockdown, drag out fight uh, to get Israel to give up the strategic passes in Sinai and the Egyptian oil fields. But when finally Kissinger convinced Rabin to do that, uh, he rewarded Israel with a kind of cornucopia of military commitments. Uh, and that upgraded the commitment to Israel's uh, military edge. And then came Jimmy Carter and the negotiation of the Israel-Egypt Peace Treaty, which took it to the next level again in terms of the commitment um, of, of military assistance to Israel um, to enable it to make the complete withdrawal from the Sinai involved in the Israel-Egypt peace treaty. And so it went on at each stage of Israel's uh, territorial concessions to the Arabs, the level of commitment to Israel's military superiority grew until it is now at the point where um, Israel's qualitative military edge is the United States committed to maintaining that against any combination, possible combination of Arab adversaries, including the Arab countries that are already at peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, Israel withdrew, uh, unilaterally withdrew from Gaza and uprooted Jewish settlements and communities. Uh, the Palestinian leadership has been clear that its intention is to occupy the land from the river to the sea. 
How could Israel withdraw from the West Bank when it would mean the creation of a Palestinian entity bent on Israel's destruction? Well, the whole the whole point of, of the peace process is to achieve peace, not a continuation of war. Um, and so there wouldn't be a deal um, the, that the United States broke it um, that involved um, the scenario that, that the questioner just lays out. The problem with Israel's withdrawal from Gaza was that it was done unilaterally. It was not done under American diplomatic auspices as part of an agreement between Israel and the PLO. Uh, Sharon withdrew and threw the keys over the fence and Hamas then took over. Um, that is the opposite of a peace process. That's not territory for peace and it's not territory for time. It's territory for nothing. And, and so it's, it's a real anti-peace uh, uh, process move, even though it was a major concession on Israel's part. And, and I think that, that, you know, nobody is suggesting that Israel withdraw from the West Bank in the absence of an agreement that provided the kind of security guarantees and security arrangements on the ground that would prevent the very scenario that the question, the questioner is suggesting. And don't forget, there's a guy named Indic in a book called Master of the Game, who said there you were as U.S. ambassador with Prime Minister Sharon, and that when he decided to pull the Israelis out of Gaza, your view was he was giving up a little thing in order to keep the West Bank. Correct. That was Sharon's calculation. Territory for time. Give up Gaza by time to settle in the West Bank. It was essentially uh, Sharon's calculation, a strategic uh, move on his part. Uh, we do have to wrap up, but as a last question, uh, what would you say to future negotiators 20, 30 years from now, besides reading your book, um, what advice would you give um, them in trying to negotiate uh, the conflicts in the Middle East? Well, 20 to 30 years from now, I hope, that, that uh, Kissinger's timetable will, will kick in and there will be an end, end of the conflict. That are, they won't need it. The diplomats of those, day, of those days uh, won't need uh, my advice. But in the meantime, I do think it's, it's very important to go back to Kissingerian first principles, to reinvent the peace process in his gradual, incremental way. Today, we can see that uh, there's no way to get to a two-state solution, end of conflict, end of claim agreement from where we are. The Israeli left right-wing coalition government cannot agree on what the objective should be any more than the Palestinians who are split between Hamas and, and, and uh, the Palestinian Authority can agree. And so in a way we're forced back to the incremental approach. And the Israeli government is talking about and doing steps, taking steps. Um, those steps, I believe, need to be enhanced. They need, in a Kissingerian way, to be given a territorial component, not in terms of a major Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank, but in terms of handing over parts of Area C to the Palestinians. The Israeli government is talking about giving some 1,900 permits to build, the Palestinians to build in Area C. Area C is the 60% of the West Bank that Israel still has complete control of. And there are other ways in which this government is looking at, at that. And the United States, I think, needs to get behind that and, and, and um, enlarge it, bring Egypt and Jordan into the process, which the Abraham Accords has made more possible, and, and start to a reinstill some trust and confidence between the two sides in the intentions of the other. And in that way, step by step, we can eventually move to a final status negotiation. Probably not in our lifetimes, maybe a long time from now, but we need to have an incremental process that gives both sides the sense, both sides the sense that there's fairness in this process, that there reasonable aspirations for security on Israel's side and for 
independence and freedom from occupation on the Palestinian side, that those aspirations can indeed be met. Great, thank you. And on that note, uh, I want to thank you, Ambassador Indic. I want to thank you, Dan Raviv, for joining us. Uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, in the audience for watching. I will send out a follow-up email later this week uh, that will have a link to the recording, so please share, as well as a link to uh, the ambassador's book. So please, uh, that is available now at your local bookstores as well as on Amazon. Uh, I also want to remind folks to tune in next week uh, when we have journalist Kati Mark. Uh, talking about her new book uh, about uh, Angela, Angela Merkel uh, from Germany. So thank you again, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Dan. Bye-bye. All the best.